elementary kids may be dismissed to children's worship. You can give up on that one just here. That was like, wow. Let me tell you, there's still a lot to go here. We're, we're going to be blessed by God's word, and there's even, even the rest of the day. There's just so much in today. But happy Mother's Day, everybody. We're glad you're here. I see a number of faces that are new, so I want to welcome you. If you're just visiting because of what we have going on here just a little bit later, we, we, we're glad you're here. If you're looking for a church home, we're glad you're here. My name is Brian. I'm our lead pastor, and this worship guide you got when you came in, we're going to go into God's Word together. On the back, there is an outline that you'll see up here in these notes that kind of frame out God's Word as we talk about that today. To our guests, even if you're just visiting, we would love that you fill out this Connect card. We would love just to send you an email saying thanks for hanging out on Mother's Day with us. But if you are looking for a church home, we'd love to help you on those steps too. Everybody else, you know this, prayers, praises, anything that we can walk with you, we would love to hear that. And when you're done with these, drop them off in the boxes as you head out or go to our Welcome Center. But I just have a couple announcements because I'm really excited to get in the Word with you today. And so if you want to turn with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 15 while I go over these announcements. So first, um, out in this lobby, in our West Lobby, there is a big video screen. And it's an interesting thing that we've been working on for several months with the Beach Museum at Kansas State University. It is an art project. Those are actually video portraits. And I'm not going to tell you about them. I want you to actually scan the QR code. There's a little bit of a sign next to it. Scan the QR code, and you'll understand what this project that we're working with the Beach Museum is. But I can give you a hint. Our goal always is that we learn how to see people. And that's exactly what this art project is. It'll be here for three months. We're kind of one of the prototypes for that. So go out and check that out. Our local church conference, our annual meeting is tomorrow night. And you're going to say, well, hold on, that was last week. Well, it was until we went into tornado warnings that night, and we had to postpone it. So the weather looked bad, the weather was bad. It hit right when we would have had that meeting. We would have all been in the basement having ice cream. That would have been cool, wouldn't it? And our safety team's like, that would have been a really good exercise to go through. But that is tomorrow night. Tomorrow night is our local church conference, 6.30 p.m. Please be here. Everybody, please be here. We're going to celebrate what God's done. We're going to talk about what God is going to do in the next year. So we'd love to have you here. And there's ice cream. There's child care for zero to three. But please come back tomorrow night. The weather looks much better. Uh, a safe night to hang out. So, All right, let's jump right into this parable. Uh, so this parable in Luke chapter 15, you know, as if you're familiar with this, it's one of the most popular parables. It's called the prodigal son. But what's interesting, when you look at this in context, it is the third time in a row that Jesus shares a parable about something that is lost. He starts with the lost sheep, he talks about the lost coin, and then he gets into this parable about the lost son. And this is a really good, so that's the setup here. So let's go into, we're going to kind of walk through this scripture together. So here we start in verse 11. And it says, to illustrate this point further, Jesus told them the story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now, before you die. And so his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. All right. If you've got used to anything in this series, it's these parables start out strong. They blow you up in the middle. They blow you up late. So here we go. This is, this is in context 2,000 years ago, this is about as shocking as it would be today. It, to illustrate this point further, so Jesus is following up. Lost sheep, lost coins. Now we're going to talk about lost son. To illustrate this point further, he tells him this story. The man had two sons, Jewish man, two sons, the younger, approaches him and says, I want what's due to me in my inheritance now. 
This would have been so shocking to a Jewish crowd to hear this because this is something you don't do. Just like you would imagine in Western culture today, we would not give our inheritance to our kid who's 19 years old going to college. And so this was, it really has a shocking start to it, but in essence, the youngest son is saying, you're already dead to me. Now, that seems strong, but how many of us stormed out the house at 16, 17, 18? Amen? Remember the independence you wanted, and maybe the relationship with your parents? But that's kind of what's going on here. He's, this is a, a relational issue that we see here. And what's more shocking, well, in, in the son, he's the youngest. So if you go to U Deuteronomy, you look at the, the law, of Jewish law, the youngest would have got one-third of the estate. The oldest would have gotten two-thirds of his estate. And dad pays it out. Even more shocking. Would you give your inheritance to an 18-year-old going out into the world? And so here's our first sermon note together here on the back. And this one's kind of different because it seems like it doesn't fit, but it really is setting the foundation here of everything we're going to talk about. This first note is God entrusts us with his children. So here's the foundation I really want to set early because everything in this parable kind of builds off of this. God entrusts us with his children. So we've been in this sermon series now for our fourth this week. This is the last one, but we've been talking about entrusted. We've been talking about we don't own anything biblically but we're entrusted with everything. We're entrusted with our money and our wealth. We're entrusted with our compassion in our hearts. That's, all these are in those different parables. You can go back and watch these on YouTube or whatever. We're entrusted last week during graduation week with our talents and abilities. And this week, we're entrusted with our children. So two things, mom and dad. One, you don't own your children. We don't own them. And that might be a shock to us, but we don't own our children. We're entrusted with them. If you go back to Ephesians, it says, the Bible reminds us, that God knew the name of your child before he set the foundation of the world. The creator, they're his children, they're entrusted with us. But the second thing, not only do we not own our children, we don't control them. Now you might think when they're in diapers at one years old that we do control them. Technically their movements and everything, yes, but it doesn't take long before they get their own opinions, their own heart, their own soul, that they start to share that with you. And you know that really we don't control, but God entrusts us to shape them. He entrusts us to teach them truth. He entrusts us to encourage them. And the one thing he entrusts us with the most, and I think this is the most important tool we have with all of our kids, is grace. Unconditional love. We're going to need that the most. God trusts us with his children. So let's go back into, okay, that sets the stage. Let's go back into the story, starting in verse 13. So a few days later, this younger son packed up all his belongings and he moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. And about this time, his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. So we know within just days of getting a third of the estate, he takes off. And he goes the farthest way he can. <laughs> Same for some of us as kids, right? We went as far away from mom and dad as we can. Why? Because the accountability is a little bit less and nobody knows me. Instead of investing what he was given in land, which was so valuable, he had a great time. And he blew it all. And when he, he just chased every desire of the world. And what happens when we chase the desires of the world? What normally happens when we chase the desires of the world? We become empty, penniless, starving, desperate. 
everybody here in the story is so offended by everything that's going on. But to know and understand that in a famine where jobs are thin, everything struggles, to know that he did get a job is amazing. It's feeding pigs. If you remember Jewish tradition, to be near a pig is unclean. He spent, he had the worst, least job in the mud feeding pigs, which made him unclean all the time, which kind of probably was the nature of exactly where he was at. And he's feeding these carob pods, you know, these big things that, that hang off the like trees. It was, a, it, was a f- it was a feed common, especially in times of famine, and they looked so good, it made him hungry too. And ladies and gentlemen, this is a beautiful description of finding the end of yourself. This is where you finally come to the end of yourself. And he knows it. And so here's a note for us to kind of encourage us a little bit today. Our children will test their faith. Our children will test their faith. God entrusts us while we're raising our children to raise them in faith. That means largely the faith that they have as they become teenagers is what has been given to them, what has been instructed to them. When they leave into the world, they will test their faith. Why? Because they have to own it. Now it's their decisions. Now it's their way in life. They test it because they have to own it. And so all those years, all those formative years in the home, I want to let you know that every day our children, and you guys know this, every day our children are discipled by the world. Every day our children are discipled by social media, by the internet, by movies, by their friends, sports culture, whatever those things are, they're discipled by that. Our job is to raise them in faith and disciple them in the ways of the Lord. If we are not discipling our children at home, the world is. And man, the one thing they have today that I didn't have, it took longer to get this information, but with a smartphone and scanning, you watch their usage, almost all the time they're on their smartphone, they're being discipled by the world. So parents, are we discipling them at home? Because if we aren't the only people that are discipling them, if you're relying on this church hour on Sunday, and maybe a children's ministry moment to disciple our children, we're going to be super far behind the ball. It's like, man, Pastor Brian, can you bring up a more depressing parable on Mother's Day? (laughs) So, (laughs) when they leave home, you shape them for independence. They have to go out and make their own decisions, including owning their faith. And their faith will endure a test. It will. A young man I just met with uh, a couple weeks ago, KSU, just got done this week, sophomore year, got here, Christian family, strong Christian family, very involved in the church. I was having coffee with him, and he's talking about when he got here, he couldn't wait to make his own way in the world. And then he took the world religions class at Kansas State University. And for a period of time, he says, that is really interesting. The only faith he had is what his parents gave him, so he went and tried all that out. Eastern mysticism, things like that. He explored it. And one day he said, he looked at me and said, Brian, one day I was walking and there was a Christian group uh, on campus and I just walked wide around them. And they called me out. And he says, no, just keep walking. And he said, keep walking. But another voice said, no, stop. He had a foundation. That foundation really got tested, really explored some other things. And if he hadn't stopped that day, not only did he stop, not only did he develop friendships at that level, he was baptized. He tested. We have to own our faith. Back to verse 17. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, you know, at home, even the hired servants have enough food, have food enough to spare, and and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. 
please take me on as a hired servant. For those of us who've gone to college or went out in the world right after we're raised, we know what homesick looks like. Homesick can be literal. I just want to come home. Karen and I, our boys boomeranged a lot out of college. They would come home, and it, for us as empty nesters, it's kind of nice. They came home for a little while, and then, okay, boot you back out, go flap your wings, you know, but homesick is also spiritual. The very foundations are laid in their lives. They'll become homesick for that when they get too far away. That foundation of faith is always there. God never stops pursuing our children. And I know our moms and dads' hearts don't either. But what's interesting is what the son is rehearsing. He's rehearsing three things. Father, I have sinned against both heaven, which is a way of graciously not calling God's name out in Jewish culture, but heaven. I've sinned against God and I've sinned against you. And I'm no longer your son. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. It's the second thing. Third thing is, I would appreciate just coming home and being your servant. Can you feel the shame through all that? he rehearses this is exactly what I'm going to say when I get home so let's see what happens when he goes home verse 20 so the young man returned home to his father and while he was still a long way off his father saw him coming and filled with love and compassion he ran to his son he embraced him and he kissed him his son said to him what he'd rehearsed, right? He said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for the son of mine was dead. And has now returned to life. He was lost. And now he's found. So the party began. And so you see a beautiful, man, this is the most powerful part of this whole, this whole parable. The son comes home. You may be picking up the way Jesus is telling a story, that the father in his story is our father in heaven. And this is how he sees us. Even though it is God that we're looking at this parable, it has a lot of Christ theme in it. How we see God through Christ. And so, there's three things that happen here that's really important for us. So our next sermon, oh, entrusted parents, that's us. For those of us who have children, someday we'll have children. For grandparents, doesn't matter. Entrusted parents. First, don't take your eye off the horizon. What is so beautiful in this parable is that when he was a long way off, his father saw him coming. That means his eyes were on the horizon every day waiting for his son to come home. I think it's so interesting the two parables before is how far God would chase. Here's how far, how long God would wait until we find the end of ourselves and be ready. Entrusted parents, don't take your eyes off the horizon. For many of us who have prodigals, who have children that have strayed, don't take your eye off the horizon. And remember each day the power of prayer as a parent cease never cease to pray second thing entrusted parents are ready with an embrace parents run to their children they meet them on the road the dignity of a first century man to pull up his his I'm trying to remember the word 
pull it up and run it was very undignifying but so far we have not seen the father worry too much about any of this and he ran he met him on the road and he embraced him and kissed him the Greek tense of this means that he didn't stop embracing him and kissing him And what's so interesting in here is the minute he's getting hugged and kissed, his son is trying to recite these three things that he remembered. Father, I have sinned against heaven and you, and I'm not worthy to be your son. And he cuts him off from the third thing. He doesn't even allow him to ask about being a servant before he cuts him off and says, go do this. Go do this. And the third thing for us as entrusted parents is celebrate when our children come home. The finest robe that they had would have been the father's, but it signifies royalty. You're being treated like a king. The ring is probably the signet ring, which has the mark of the family, which is allowed to do all transactions. Not only was his son established to his sonship, but authority in the home. And to have sandals, slaves and servants did not have things for their feet. And he would not let his son be a slave or servant. But not only that, they crank up the feast. Why? Because my son was lost and now is found. He has come back to faith, a faith that saves you for all of us. For all of us as parents, we get this. I don't care what my son might become and what my sons, I'm very proud of them, but nothing is more important to me than their faith. Nothing is more important than their faith. And what's so beautiful about this parable is you see the unconditional and merciful love of the Father and we see all these tones of Christ throughout it. R. Kent Hughes wrote, no one is beyond his love. You cannot do anything that will keep him from kissing you and bestowing upon you the robe, the ring, and the sandals. Utter forgiveness is the only kind God gives. And when we see the Father meet him with arms wide open, we see the tones of Christ on the cross with his arms wide open, paying that sin for all of us. How all of us got far away, many of us got really far away, many of us have found the end of ourselves. Christ's embrace is on the cross. He died so that we could be forgiven, utterly forgiven by the Father. No conditions. And Jesus' embrace started with the cross. Arms wide open. And it just requires that we see that we know we have a sinful nature and we can see this unconditional love of God, especially through Jesus, and we can always turn and come home. And if you do not believe that God bestows upon you forgiveness, all this royalty, it's not only that he utterly forgives, it's how he utterly restores and to think a robe, a signet ring, a full authority and everything, we jump right into Ephesians chapter three. It says, God raised us up with Christ and seats us with him. That is the heart of our father. And that is the heart that we're called to have as parents. Verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working, and when he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Well, your brother's back, he was told, and your father's killed the fattened calf, and we're celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry, and he wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. 
Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. But remember, the older son also got an inheritance. Two-thirds. In the field, he's hearing a party come on and it's uncontrolled anger. In the midst of that, his father is begging him to come into the home. And this sermon note hit me like a ton of bricks. And so here's our fourth sermon note. Our first child is not like our second. You can laugh. It's kind of funny. I thought it was pretty funny when I wrote it. For those of us who have more than one child, we know that, man, we raise up this first one, and like we protect, we put a bubble around them, they're super safe, and we do all these things, and then we like learn everything, and then the second one comes, it's like, hold on a second, they're not like the first one at all, and we rub them around the dirt, and we throw them out the door, you know, type, that's how we raise, but it's like, the second one is not like the first. And we see in the son a strong self-righteous behavior. We see that he looks good on the outside, but he's really dead on the inside. He's critical, he's judgmental, he's unloving. Some argue he was further away from the father's heart than the one that left. He wouldn't welcome the broken and the lost to come home. Right? We got a long ways away from home at one time. But the one none of us want to identify is the type of church that doesn't care about the broken and lost coming in. The one that's a holy huddle and takes care of itself. The church that doesn't exist for the people on the outside. That's the self-righteous behavior it's trying to attack. The church that's critical and judgmental and unloving and uses that as an excuse. And truthful is, probably all of us wrestled with a little of both of this at times. But we got this beautiful par parable from Jesus that teaches us how to be parents and how to have this love of God through Christ that's exampled through Christ in all of us. That's fueled by truth. It's fueled by grace. It's fueled unconditionally. As we finish up this parable, verse 31 and 32, his father said to him, to the older son, look, dear son, you've always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. It's interesting, the father gave him everything too. He was favored, and he couldn't see it. Two sons, one that left the faith and one that maybe never understood the heart of faith. But the importance of this parable is the story of the Father's love, the same love we're called to have for our children and for others. That's the heart of this story. And when it, when it comes to offering, when it comes to offering, I can't think of a better way than, here's our last sermon note together, and that is raise our children in the ways of the Lord. So you know, offering is always a time that we respond to the word, we respond to, to what the Holy Spirit has put upon our heart, but we can't think of a better way to say this is what we believe and it starts when our children are little. And so today, in both services, we're dedicating nine children to the Lord. We had four in the first service, five. You guys have seen a lot of new babies around here, amen? <laughs> and we're catching up. So let me tell you a little bit about child dedication, why this is so important. This is a beautiful offering for us as a church. Child dedication is that, as a bold church community, we have several families today that are gonna bring forth their children and commit to raising them in the power of the Holy Spirit in the community of faith 
and in Jesus Christ. So let me summarize that. They are choosing to raise their children and go upstream against the current of this world. Our children are the next building blocks of our church. So valuable. And in the power of the Spirit, these children one day will carry our mission and our vision of Christ's church. This dedication ceremony is a public statement by the parents that they desire to raise their children in the ways of the Lord. That's Proverbs 22, 6. Raise your children in the ways of the Lord. Brian's version is, and they will not stray far from it. Now, that's not biblically exact, but I just know they're going to go out and test because they have to own it. And the strongest desire that we have is one day these children will grow and mature in their faith and they will make their own personal and public profession and they will jump in the water and be baptized. That is a day that's very important on every parent's heart. This dedication is biblical. It follows the same pattern we see in Joseph and Mary taking the baby Jesus to the temple to be dedicated. We also see that children, Jesus welcomed children openly in the gospel of Mark. He said, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. And then he took the children in his arms, and he placed his hands on their heads, and he blessed them. So I'd like to invite up the families who are dedicating their children, and while they're coming up, would you watch these videos of their children who we're dedicating today? For this child, I have prayed, and you heard my cry. For this baby, I had faith, and you gave new life. In this moment, now I pray, and I vow to you this day. So parents, you have brought your children here today to dedicate them to the Lord. You're proclaiming not only your faith in Jesus, but your desire for your children to grow, to be like Jesus also. Webs, you can go ahead. As we're talking about today, you are entrusted with your children. You're entrusted by God to teach them God's word, to teach them the importance of the church as a healthy place to learn, love, and pray, and more importantly, your child will be the church. They are the church already. And they carry the presence of God inside them and they become his light to the world. You can only do this to the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit. So I have three vows for you as parents. So be bold. You can use the mic too if you want to make sure it carries. <laughs> so these three vows for you. And church, get ready. You're going to have some here in a little while too. So simply respond by we do. Do you promise to pray for and with your child and teach them God's word to see that they grow in knowledge of God through Jesus and daily are drawn towards him. We do. Okay. Do you promise to take your own relationship with God seriously so that you can be a spiritual example for your child? We do. And do you promise to do all you can so that in God's timing your child will begin a relationship with him through faith in Jesus Christ and follow that faith with repentance and baptism? We do. Good. Good. All right, I'm going to squeeze. Let me squeeze in right here because I don't want to stand in front of you. We're going to start with the McNellis family. So this is Nathan and Brenna, and their firstborn, Declan Creed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we get to hang out in the office every once in a while, so it's like. So what I'd like you is, is uh, Brenna and Nathan, I'd like you to share. This is your dedication verse that you've chosen for Declan. So share that with us and explain why did you pick this scripture? 
Yeah, so this is Mark eleven twenty two through 24. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. So um, the name Declan actually means man of prayer, and we didn't know that when we picked it, but it's been very fitting for him in that um, he's challenged us in our prayer life, and um, we want to encourage him in his prayer life that as long as he stays strong and stays firm and continues to talk and have a relationship with God, that um, nothing can stand against him. So let's do a prayer of dedication for Declan. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, here's the firstborn son of the McNeil's family. And Father, we pray the same thing for him. We pray that Declan, this is a thing. Jesus says you will do even bigger things than I have done. And Declan, you're coming into a world where you have resources and ability, but it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that Declan, you change the world. And so your parents already see that in you. So Declan, we now dedicate you in the name of the Father, His Son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit who will guide you every day of your life. Amen. Amen. It's okay. You can clap. So everybody, let's welcome here. We've got, um, this is Riley Hartley and her daughters. We got Jada and we got Zoe. So let's start with Jada, so Riley, and if you want to look at the scriptures right overhead too, <laughs> and you. Okay, this is Timothy, Timothy 4.12, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech and conduct and love and faith and impurity. And I chose this one for Jada just because she's just like got such a sweet um, soul and she's um, been so like pure her whole life and she's had an impact on me um, even at such a young age so Jada can I come over here and pray with you would that be okay let's, let's do a prayer dedication on Jada bow our heads with me Jada this is an amazing amazing scripture your mom picked out for you Father, we pray for Jada. We pray that everything in her life points to you. As the scripture says, not only her purity or holiness, Father, all the ways that she resembles your son, but most importantly, the way she loves. As Jesus said, the way she loves you, Father, with her whole mind, heart, soul, spirit, and how she loves our neighbor. And so, Jada, we pray that you grow up to be a strong woman of faith, that everybody just looks at you and knows this light that's in you points to Jesus. And we now dedicate you in the name of the Father, His Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit who will guide you every day of your life. Amen. All right. Here's Zoe. <laughs> Okay, this is Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things, God works for the good and for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So this is just um, whatever path um, Zoe goes on, but she knows that she has a bigger purpose and that she's able to find it. Zoe, can we pray for you? Can we pray for you? Can I put my hand right here? Hi. Let's pray for Zoe. Heavenly Father, this is your special daughter that you knew before you set the foundation of the earth. And Father, we pray just as the scripture says, we pray that, Father, we know there's going to be amazing times and there's going to be difficult times in life, but, Father, we want Zoe to know even through the hard times that you will shape her. You will shape her and work good in everything. And that Zoe knows every day that she has a bigger purpose. A big purpose. Father says, you say you have plans for her, to plans to prosper and not to harm her. And that these plans grow her into a great woman of God, that all people are drawn to Christ through her. So now we dedicate her in the name of the Father, His Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, Zoe, who will walk with you every day. Amen. Good job. <laughs> Julie. 
yeah, we're going to come way down here. So everybody, this is Julia Wakabula, and this is Austin John. So I'll hold the mic. Does that help? Yeah, <laughs> I'll hold the you. mic. And there's a scripture up there. So Julia, share with us why you picked this scripture. Well, I almost just talked about that one. But would you share this one with us and why you picked it? I picked Jeremiah 29, 11. I thought, like, in our day-to-day -day life, if anyone is going through a difficulty situation, can, can find comfort in that scripture, knowing that however hard the situation may be, God has promises for us, and you can go through it, and in the future or any time, things can work out according to God's plan, and you can find comfort and joy. All right, let's sneak in here. Austin John, let's bow our heads and let's pray dedication for you. Heavenly Father, this is your son, Austin. And Father, we do, as Jeremiah says, we know that you have plans for him. Also, Psalm 139 says that you know every day of his life. They're all counted. And Father, we know that these plans are for good. And so, Father, we want Austin to know every day that your first plan is to change him to look more like your son, Jesus. And your second plan for him is to change the world so that they can look like Jesus too. And so we plan every day for Austin that's ahead that you show him the good that you do through him and just give him a great joy that moves him forward each day. And so now we dedicate him in the name of the Father, his son Jesus, who loves him so much. He died for him. And the Holy Spirit who will guide Austin every day of his life. Amen. 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 Well, guys, this is Braille and Kalen Spies. Um, I, uh, I won't call you out just a little bit. They, like, commute here from Beloit all the time <laughs> to, to be at church with us. And so this is, there's, everybody here is special, but I just think it's so cool. Uh, this is their son, Henry Owen. So share with us a little bit about why this scripture is. Read it for us and share why did you pick this one for Henry. So uh, I'm a huge fan of Romans, and kind of the example picture we got had three different Romans yeah. verses in it, and so that was pretty cool. Um, but what's even more cool, what's, what's, it's just a God thing, but um, in uh, Romans 8, 28, um, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. But it goes on in 29 and 30 here. Sorry, I don't want to no, preach. Keep going, but keep going. No, preach. <laughs> preach. Uh, it's okay. It's kind of, like I said, just a God thing. I, I just read into it a little more and kind of read the whole passage. But it says, for those God knew, <laughs> sorry, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to his image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. And um, I just think that touches on Henry Perfect because he's the firstborn son, and um, we're going to glorify him as much as we can and pray over him and we hope that we're able to instill a, a really good foundation in him, but also that as he gets older, he can be a good example for his brothers and sisters, hopefully, to come. <laughs> and um, because they can see us setting the example for how to have a good marriage and, and, you know, love each other. But if they have somebody that's almost their age and he's doing it too, they're not going to think we're crazy. So they'll be a lot easier to follow and and be able to disciple them and um, be fishers of men. So, yeah. Let's come right around here. I'll sneak in between you guys. and Let's pray for Henry Owen. Henry, we look at the scripture of Romans and, and even the part that your dad added into, which is so important. Henry, every day the Spirit will grow you. That joy we already see in his picture and on your face will become more when you understand the purpose that God has for you. And one day, like the scripture says, Henry, you will be justified. You will jump in the water 
and you'll indicate that you want to follow him every day of your life. And in that justification, every day you will grow in holiness. And when you grow in holiness, every day your life is going to point others as your life glorifies God. That's your purpose. So Henry, we now dedicate you in the name of the Father, his son Jesus who loves you with everything, and the Holy Spirit who will be a power and source of life for you every day. Amen. 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 A good grip. <laughs> Slip down here at the end. All right, church, would you rise with me? Because you have vows too. It's our turn that we stand for this family and stand with them. The old adage, it takes a village to raise a child, we would say it takes a church to raise a child. The church is God's design for support, encouragement, and strengthening this family. The church is the body of Christ. That means every one of you have a gift and talent that helps this family, as well as all of them have a gift and talent. These babies have a gift and talent that will one day serve and edify you. So don't leave these families to battle on their own, but get to know them, come together in community with them, corporately love them, and support one another. So we make these vows together as a church, and I'd ask that you simply respond with a little bit of gusto. We do. Church, do you promise to pray for these parents as they raise their children to trust and follow Christ? Thank you. Church, do you promise to take your own relationship with God seriously so that you can be a spiritual example to these children? And church, do you promise to do all you can to help and support these families in their effort to build a godly home? We do. Let's do an offering prayer now for everything today. This is our offering of raising our children in the ways of the Lord. Amen? Amen. So let's bow our heads together in every offering we got from God's word, worship, Mother's Day. Let's just throw it all in here. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for today. What a gift. Thanks for Mother's Day that we could do something special like this. And Father, we're praying our first offering is these families who have chosen to go against the grain to raise their children in the ways of the Lord so that they will not depart from it. And Father, this church has made vows too, and we take these vows very seriously, but what an offering because all this points to you and glorifies you through Christ. Father, also our offering today is as we go through the prodigal, that we examine our hearts. You're never too far from home. And to be the church that loves and parents that love unconditionally full of grace and truth. That's the church we want to be. And not only in here, but out in the world. That's our offering today. That these words penetrate our heart and change us. And how we give financially, how we give of our time, our abilities, all serves this mission. And so, Father, we lift this offering up to you because the offering that was lifted on the cross to us is immeasurable. Let our response be full of love to you today. And we pray this in the mighty name of Christ and all God's people said. Amen. Would you give these families a great <laughs> thank you. Yeah. To the mom with little children, you are their whole world. Your all-consuming job may feel endless, but never dull. Enjoy these early years, for in a blink they're gone. And thank God who grants you strength when nights are short and days are long. You juggle diapers and tantrums, skin, knees, and elbows, but keep raising those babies up in the way that they should go. To the mom with tweens and teens, hold on tight. This too shall pass. They'll be off to college, then with kids of their own, and it happens just that fast. Be an example of one who loves the Lord and show them what it means to seek God's word. Inspire them to be the change they want to see and encourage them in all God created and called them to be. To the mom who has a child, with extra challenges and special needs. 
God picked you out on purpose. He must have known your strength. You know the weight of motherhood in a completely different way. But would you give it up or change it even for a day? A mother's heart loves just one way. It only loves completely. It aches and triumphs just the same, no matter the disability. To the mothers who've lost a child, with you I ache and grieve. There are days when we might feel the pain will never ease. In fact, it might not, yet we press forward and press on, for simply having was a blessing, no matter for how long. Knowing our child is in a heavenly place is a special reminder of God's goodness and grace. To the woman who longs to, yet has not conceived, you are not defined by infertility. Despite all the trying, months or years of feeling empty, do not think that a mom you can never be. Bearing a child of your own is not the only way. You can love, nurture, and guide those in your midst every day. God is in control, and though you may not understand, trust in Him. He knows your heart, and He holds the master plan. To the mom who's older now, with kids who are all grown, perhaps they're very busy raising littles of their own. So much wisdom and advice about parenting you could share, but you know most of all, your kids still need your prayer. Though it changes over time, a mother's job is never done, to teach and mold and point the way to Christ, the saving one. To women of all ages, with children or without, how many, if any, or what age is not what Mother's Day is about. God created every one of us so special and unique, all beautiful, all gifted, with different weaknesses and strengths. Motherhood is more than physical, it's an attitude of the heart, to bloom and grow where'er God plants you, for you are his work of art. I'm glad you're standing. We're going to close in worship. For some of you, if that sounded familiar, um, I wrote it probably eight or nine years ago now. Uh, so it was a reshare. Uh, the funny thing is, at that point in my life, uh, Justin and I had been married 10 years or close to it, and my only brush with motherhood ended in early loss. So before I was a mom, uh, I wrote that, but it's interesting how God continues to write that story. And the whole point of that is to celebrate women in all seasons, and that's what we want to do today with our Mother's Day. So as you leave, uh, you'll see in the lobby a table full of small plants. Um, please don't leave any with us. We want you to take those. Um, be blessed by it or take one and give to a, a mom that you would like to, to bless. And then also on that table, we have a wonderful group called Mom Life that meets on Tuesday mornings. Um, and it's very life-giving to all of us that um, are plugged in. So we'd like to invite you. Uh, I know sometimes schedules change for teachers who are out for the summer or for parents who adjust work hours when the kids are out of school so maybe Tuesdays doesn't work year round for you but if it will this summer um, we'd love to have you and it's not a every week commitment out there on those tables are flyers it lets you know two weeks out of the month we're always here doing devotionals praying over each other mentoring each other encouraging each other and there's child care the other weeks of the month we're at splash parks and swimming pools and taking trips around the area with our kiddos and so you can plug in anytime uh, this summer that it works for you or you can take that flyer and invite the mom across the street or the lady that moved in next door or the person with the deployed husband who's trying to do it on her own um, so use that um, as God leads you and uh, oh I will say also we're kicking off we've got a Saturday morning event too called the mommy and me and it's on your worship guide um, that I'll just extend it to aunt and me and grandma and me and whoever you might want to bring if you have a little in your life that you are influencing um, to next Saturday morning's event. And uh, we're going to close in worship. This last song is 
kind of our prayer over everything that's happened this morning. We want to speak the name of Jesus over the prodigals. We want to speak the name of Jesus over our church and our hearts if we're not receiving the lost ones back home. We want to speak the name of Jesus over the little kiddos that were up here sharing song and scripture. We want to speak the name of Jesus over these babies we just dedicated. So God, hear our prayer this morning. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing Your name shadows burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression I speak to you Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus.
the same benediction I did last week, but we're going to tie it to our sermon note that was number one today. It says, to whom much has been given, much will be required. And so for us, God has entrusted us with his children, and I mean all of us in this church family. So much is required as we go here today and commit to raising them up. Have a great week, everybody. You kept me clean, you brushed my hair, took me around with you everywhere. How did you do it?